ਸਤਿ ਸ਼੍ਰੀ ਅਕਾਲ ਐਂਡ ਵੈਲਕਮ ਟੂ ਸੀਜੇ ਸਿੱਧੂ ਸ਼ੋ ਜਿਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਤੁਹਾਨੂੰ ਪਤਾ ਹੀ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਐਵਰੀ ਥਰਸਡੇ ਅਸੀਂ ਤੁਹਾਡੀ ਗੱਲ ਕਰਾਈ ਦੀ ਹੈ ਕਿਸੇ ਨਾ ਕਿਸੇ ਪੋਲਿਟੀਸ਼ੀਅਨ ਨਾਲ ਐਕਚੁਅਲੀ ਮੋਸਟਲੀ ਪੋਲਿਟੀਸ਼ੀਅਨਾਂ ਨਾਲ ਐਂਡ ਜਾਂ ਕਿਸੇ ਮੈਡੀਕਲ ਡਾਕਟਰ ਨਾਲ ਕਮਿਊਨਿਟੀ ਐਕਟਿਵਿਸਟ ਨਾਲ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਵੀ ਆਪਣੀ ਇਨਫੋਰਮੇਸ਼ਨ ਆਪਣੀ ਕਮਿਊਨਿਟੀ ਲਈ ਜ਼ਰੂਰੀ ਹੈ ਉਹ ਕੋਸ਼ਿਸ਼ ਕਰੀ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਵੱਧ ਤੋਂ ਵੱਧ ਤੁਹਾਡੇ ਤੱਕ ਪਹੁੰਚਾਈ ਜਾ ਸਕੇ ਫਰਸਟ ਹੈਂਡ ਇਨਮੋਰਸ਼ਨ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਭੇਜੀ ਜਾ ਸਕੇ ਤੁਹਾਡੇ ਤੱਕ ਆ ਹੋਲੀਡੇ ਸੀਜ਼ਨ ਹੈ ਸਾਰੇ ਹੁਣ ਇਸ ਨੂੰ ਸੈਲੀਬ੍ਰੇਟ ਕਰ ਰਹੇ ਹੈ ਸੋ ਅਸੀਂ ਕਈ ਵਾਰੀ ਔਨ ਲੋਕੇਸ਼ਨ ਜਾ ਕੇ ਵੀ ਪ੍ਰੋਗਰਾਮ ਕਰੀਦੇ ਆ ਸੋ ਅੱਜ ਅਸੀਂ ਮਹਾਰਾਜਾ ਰੈਸਟੋਰੈਂਟ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਕਿ ਪਾਇਲ ਬਿਜ਼ਨਸ ਸੈਂਟਰ ਸਰੀ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਹੈ ਉੱਥੇ ਬੀਸੀ ਯੂਨਾਈਟਿਡ ਦੇ ਲੀਡਰ ਕੈਵਨ ਫਾਲਕਨ ਆ ਰਹੇ ਆ ਉਹ ਮੀਡੀਆ ਨੂੰ ਮਿਲਣ ਪੰਜਾਬੀ ਪ੍ਰੈਸ ਕਲੱਬ ਤੋਂ ਉਸ ਤੋਂ ਇਲਾਵਾ ਬਾਕੀ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਮੀਡੀਆ ਹੈ ਉਹ ਵੀ ਇਨਵਾਈਟ ਕੀਤਾ ਆ ਤੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਅਸੀਂ ਅੱਜ ਕਮੈਂਟਸ ਲਵਾਂਗੇ ਉਹ ਦੇਖਾਂਗੇ ਕਿ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦਾ ਪਾਰਟੀ ਪਲੈਟਫਾਰਮ ਕੀ ਹੈ ਕਿਉਂਕਿ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਇਲੈਕਸ਼ਨ ਦਾ ਮਾਹੌਲ ਹੈ ਉਹ ਭਖ ਰਿਹਾ ਹੈ ਪ੍ਰੋਵਿੰਸ਼ੀਅਲ ਇਲੈਕਸ਼ਨ ਦੀ ਆਪਾਂ ਗੱਲ ਕਰਦੇ ਆਂ ਉਹ ਪੋਲਸ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਤੁਹਾਨੂੰ ਪਤਾ ਕਿ ਡੇਵਿਡ ਈਬੀ ਕਾਫੀ ਹਾਈ ਪੋਲਸ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਉਹ ਜਾ ਰਹੇ ਆ ਤੇ ਉਧਰੋਂ ਕੰਜ਼ਰਵੇਟਿਵ ਪਾਰਟੀ ਦੇ ਵੀ ਨੰਬਰਸ ਇਨਕਰੀਜ਼ ਹੋ ਰਹੇ ਆ ਸੋ ਇਹ ਲੱਗਦਾ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਇਲੈਕਸ਼ਨ ਨੈਕਸਟ ਏਪ੍ਰਲ ਮੇ ਜੂਨ ਵੈਸੇ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਟੈਂਟੇਟਿਵ ਡੇਟ ਹੈਗੀ ਆ ਉਹ ਅਕਤੂਬਰ ਚ ਹੋਣੇ ਚਾਹੀਦੇ ਆ ਪਰ ਜਦੋਂ ਪੋਲਿਟੀਸ਼ੀਅਨ ਦੇਖਦੇ ਆ ਕਿ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦਾ ਪੋਲਸ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਨੰਬਰ ਉੱਚੇ ਜਾ ਰਹੇ ਆ ਤੇ ਉਹ ਜਦੋਂ ਮਰਜ਼ੀ ਗਵਰਨਮੈਂਟ ਤੇ ਪਲੱਗ ਪੁੱਲ ਕਰ ਸਕਦੇ ਆ ਸੋ ਸਾਰੀਆਂ ਪਾਰਟੀਆਂ ਆਪ ਦੀਆਂ ਤਿਆਰੀ ਕਰ ਰਹੀਆਂ ਇਸ ਦੇ ਸਦਕਾ ਕੈਵਨ ਫਾਲਕਨ ਬੀਸੀ ਯੂਨਾਈਟਿਡ ਵੀ ਪੂਰੇ ਜ਼ੋਰ ਸ਼ੋਰ ਨਾਲ ਆਪ ਦੇ ਕੈਂਡੀਡੇਟ ਡਿਕਲੇਅਰ ਕਰ ਰਹੇ ਆ ਸੋ ਅੱਜ ਤੁਹਾਨੂੰ ਦੱਸਾਂਗੇ ਕਿ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਕੀ ਵਿਚਾਰ ਹੈ ਕੀ ਕਹਿ ਰਹੇ ਆ ਕੀ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦਾ ਪਲੈਟਫਾਰਮ ਹੈ ਤੇ ਥੋੜੀ ਦੇਰ ਤੋਂ ਬਾਅਦ ਤੁਹਾਨੂੰ ਅਸੀਂ ਉੱਥੇ ਲੈ ਕੇ ਚੱਲਦੇ ਹਾਂ ਥੈਂਕ ਯੂ ਸਸਿਕਾਲ ਐਂਡ ਗੁੱਡ ਈਵਨਿੰਗ ਵੈਲਕਮ एवरीबॉडी ਫॉर द प्रेस मीट एंड ग्रीट विद कैवन फॉल्कन लीडर ऑफ बीसी यूनाइटेड formerly known as bc liberal party a uh, punjabi press club plus all the other media people who are not a member of punjabi press club we invited everyone today so basically how we will start is with a cabin's opening remark and then everybody i would like i would go around the table and one question and rebuttal we will see if we have more time so one question each the reporter journalist or tv host and uh, that's how we will cover the event today if we have some more time then i will be able to give you guys the more time so once again thank you on behalf of uh, bc united party welcome here for this press conference there is a lot happening and uh, you know before further ado we'll start with uh kevin falcon don't need an introduction as you know he served pretty much most of the major uh, ministries uh, minister of deregulation minister of health minister of transportation minister of finance and deputy premier so please join me welcoming kevin falcon for the opening remarks great thank you thank you sir thank you and i'm uh, thrilled to be joined by puneet sandar uh, very proudly one of our great candidates in surrey uh we will have more great announcements coming on candidates not just in surrey but around the province uh but one of the commitments i made early on as leader is i was going to make sure that in this next election by the time we rolled around to the next election we would have a group of candidates that represent the kind of background diversity more women uh and exactly the kind of strong group of candidates that we need to make sure that when we form government we'll have people that are ready to get to work right away to fix the challenges that we face and i have to tell you i'm just going to sort of um set the table to where we are in british columbia right now uh and i'll be as uh, you know as um fair minded as i can be this is i i will try not to be very political about what we face and if i get any of my information wrong you feel free to challenge me but i'm always very careful with my facts so here are the facts right now in british columbia um we have a situation where uh in almost every area that government has responsibility for the results that we are seeing unfortunately are not getting better they're
Um, everywhere I travel in this province, I always ask the question, has anybody seen any area of government responsibility that has gotten better by 36%? And I have yet to hear anyone say, yes, our healthcare system is better or our streets are safer or education's getting much better. I've never heard that. And that should concern us because if you look at our healthcare system right now, we all know from Surrey here that we have major challenges. And uh, we can see recently that now the government has rented a motel so that we can send patients from the hospital into a motel room. So that, frankly, is not the kind of service that you should be expecting to see here in British Columbia. Never had to do that in the entire 12 years that I was in government. Never. Okay? Uh, we now see portables at the Surrey Memorial Hospital to treat our children. Never had to see that happen any of the years that I was in government. That's, those are not good results. We've seen the government once again make yet another announcement about a second hospital in Surrey, uh, an, a hospital that they've been announcing now for seven years. And there, you recall the most recent announcement uh, that they made this time. The only difference was that they pulled out a piece of heavy equipment and they all put on hard hats and shovels and pretended that something was happening at the, at the site. Nothing has happened at the site. The next day, that piece of equipment was towed away, and there's been no work happening. Why? Because the announcement was actually that it was going to be delayed two more years, and that the cost for the hospital that they're proposing to build had increased from the cost they gave us last year by $1.22 billion. I've never seen anything like that in my lifetime, in all the years that I was in public life overseeing over $14 billion of capital projects. Have I ever seen projects escalate that massively before you've even put a shovel in the ground? So I think that should cause all of us some concern around healthcare. Our cancer care is, we've gone from, I was, CJ is quite correct, I was health minister in 2009, 2010. We didn't have a perfect healthcare system then either. I want to be clear about that, you know. Uh, but we had the best cancer care outcomes in North America and British Columbia. We always exceeded the benchmarks, which are the best practices in terms of when you want people to be seeing a specialist, an oncologist, or getting radiation treatment. There are benchmarks that are set out that are best practices. We always met or exceeded those benchmarks. Right now, under this government, we are the second at the bottom in the, in the country. That's a really bad result. And I've said it before, and I'll say it again, somebody should be held accountable for these lack of results. And we've called for Adrian Dix to be fired, and I'm going to continue to call for him to be fired because he's been the health minister since day one of this NDP government. And I cannot believe that you could have somebody there the entire time and see the system collapsing the way it is and nobody's held accountable. And uh, the premier's going to have to answer for that because it is really concerning. I should tell you, I, it's an emotional topic for me because many of us have family members struggling with cancer, as I do, and some of you do. And it is not acceptable that people are dying, waiting to get care for cancer in this country. And then the same government says we're going to pay for people to go south to Bellingham, Washington to get treatment. And just so you know, the last time that happened in British Columbia was the last time the NDP were in power in the 1990s. What is it about them that they mismanage our cancer care system every time to the point where we're having to send people to the United States? And this, by the way, is an NDP government that always goes on about how terrible the U.S. healthcare system is, right? Have we not all heard this? You know, the private healthcare system in the U.S., how terrible it is, and yet we are sending our patients down to that system. To me, that's hypocrisy on top of incompetence, both of which are bad. So um, that's healthcare. Then we've got the crime situation. Our streets are less safe. The government brought forward the first government, the only government in Canada that said, let's, let's decriminalize hard drugs like heroin and cocaine and methamphetamine and fentanyl. And let's see what happens with that. This is the BC experiment, the BC NDP. We said to them at the time, this is a very bad idea because you have not put the proper guardrails around this decriminalization of drugs. And if you don't do that, you're going to have really bad results. They didn't listen to us. So what happens? We start seeing open drug use in parks and playgrounds and beaches. You know, you've got a situation where we've got beaches where you're not allowed to smoke cigarettes. 
in Vancouver, you can't drink alcohol, but you can bring your heroin or your cocaine or fentanyl and you can use without any restrictions. That's not right. And only after nine months of me as the leader of the opposition pounding them and saying, you've got to bring in legislation to protect our children from the open drug use that's happening everywhere, that still wasn't enough. Only when the municipalities started coming forward and saying, we're going to pass our own bylaws because we can't deal with the, what's going on in our communities. And so whether it was up in uh, uh, Campbell River or Kamloops or the lower mainland, Brad West uh, showing leadership by saying, we're going to bring in our own bylaws to deal with this problem because the NDP government's not dealing with it. Only then did they bring in a piece of legislation that was too weak, too timid, not good enough, but at least they addressed the issue. But, you know, we still have a problem. We're not educating our kids in the schools to say to kids, drugs are a bad thing. You shouldn't do drugs. Decriminalization does not mean legalization. You know, children don't understand that distinction. We have an obligation as parents and a government to make sure our kids understand that drugs are dangerous. And instead, what we see are the an NDP government that's allowing groups to come into our schools in Victoria to teach kids how to snort cocaine safely. This is crazy. And so we will continue to oppose their reckless decriminalization. We will continue to oppose the public supply of addiction drugs, addictive drugs to struggling addicts. Because we don't think free drugs are the answer. We think free treatment is the answer. And that's why we've said that we would invest in free treatment so that people that have children or grandchildren or relatives or parents or siblings that are struggling with addiction can get the care they need. Not just give them free drugs, but get the treatment they need so they can get better and be healthy again. And then we've got education. You know, my friends, you were, you know, again, I'm just talking about results. This government promised in 2017, you remember, what did they promise about portables? That they would eliminate them, eliminate them within four years. Well, how's that going in Surrey? Are they eliminated? No. They've almost doubled the number of portables. And we now know that the school board is looking at stacking portables because they have, they're running out of room on the playgrounds and on the fields and in the parking lots to put these portables. Somebody in government should be held accountable for that promise that they made. If you're not going to deliver on a promise, don't make it. Don't make irresponsible promises that you have no intention of filling. And we will make sure that by the time the next election rolls around, we're going to remind Surrey residents of the promise that they made, whether it was for the second hospital that we've never seen or whether it was for the portables being eliminated, which they haven't done. And that ought to be very concerning. Then we'll, I want to talk about housing. Because on housing, again, back in 2017, they made some very specific promises. One of them was that they were going to build 114,000 affordable homes within 10 years. Okay? We're now in year seven of this NDP government. You know how many homes they've built? 16,000. 20% of those were started under BC Liberals. That's not a very good result. And now they're doing it again. They're saying, Ravi Kalon's saying we're going to build 250,000 homes in 10 years. Who honestly can believe this nonsense, really. I mean, I was in the building business. There's no chance they can build 250,000. Their own budget that in the last quarterly report that the finance minister just released said in their own budget that they're going to see a drop-off in housing starts of 4,500 4, homes next year. So on the one hand, the finance minister says we're going to see less new housing built and then we've got the housing minister saying, oh, don't worry, we're going to build 250,000 in 10 years. Well, they have about as much chance of building 250,000 homes as they did on the, the 114,000 homes that they promised over 10 years. So I, I'm just, all of this is a way of saying this. We have to hold politicians, including myself, accountable for results, not for what is promised and re-promised and announced and re-announced, but for the actual results we're getting. And I think that when we do that, that will be a good thing. Because I can tell you, when I become Premier of this province, I will be holding my ministers accountable for results. And I will hold our government accountable for results. Because if you are not measuring what you're doing, you cannot manage it. Just this morning, I'm reading in the newspaper in the Vancouver Sun, the Premier, they're saying to him, 
cancer care is terrible in BC. And he says, yes, I know, I'm very concerned about that. And they said, well, why won't you do what Ontario does and have independent benchmarks where they can measure how well Ontario is doing with other provinces and other jurisdictions? And David Eby says, no, no, we don't need to do that. We don't need to. They don't want to do it because they don't want, to, they don't want the public to know what kind of results we're getting. I actually want the public to know because if the public knows, that puts the pressure on us as government to make sure that what we're doing better be working. And if it's not working, because you don't always get everything right in government, if it's not working, then you know you have to change direction and do things differently so you get different results. But if you just keep going ahead and doing the same thing, expecting different results, you won't get them. And that's what's happening today. And so what will we do differently? Well, number one, we're going to make sure we focus on outcomes and results. Number two, on policing and, and public safety, we're going to scrap the decriminalization because that has been a disaster. And we're going to hold people accountable for criminal behavior because accountability is very important. Right now you have criminals that realize there's very little accountability because under this government and David Eby, while well, he was attorney general for five and a half years, they've overseen a catch and release program where people are arrested and released often the same day. And this includes people that have viciously and racially, or racially attacked people and yelled racist slurs at them. And they're released sometimes the very next day. That's not acceptable. And it, you don't have to take my word for this happening. When I was raising this in the legislature when he was attorney general, he denied it was happening. He said, you liberals are making this up. We were liberal BC liberals at the time. He said, you're just, these are anecdotal stories. You're just trying to scare the public. And we said, no, they're not, because we're hearing from police forces all across the province and from mayors. But they, they didn't believe us. Then what happened? The mayors wrote a letter to the premier, now premier. He was attorney general at the time and said, actually, in our communities, this is a major problem. Vancouver pointed out that 40 individuals, 4-0, were involved in 6,385 negative interactions with the police over a 12-month period. And, you know, every community had, you know, the major communities all had their stories. Uh, in Kelowna, it was 15 individuals that had over 1,000 negative interactions over a 12-month period with the police. So then they said, okay, it's not our problem, it's the federal government. Now they try to blame the federal government and say, well, it's because of the bail code changes. No, it's not. It's because while he was the attorney general, the number of what they call no-charge assessments, no-charge assessments are when the Crown says, Yes, please, we know you've arrested this person and you're recommending charges. We're not going to charge them. They went up 75% under this government. Okay, That's why we've got a problem. And so what we've said is we're going to deal with that. We're going to make sure people are held accountable and we're going to hire and fill the 500 vacant police positions we have right across the province in every municipality. We will make sure the municipalities have the dollars and where it's a... Uh, where it's provincial responsibility, we'll provide the dollars to make sure we hire those police that we need to protect our communities. So on health care, I, uh, I, I could spend an hour on this, but, but we all know that the biggest challenge we face is lack of doctors. And my friends, we also know that there are hundreds and hundreds of well-trained doctors that have been trained outside of British Columbia. Many of them are kids from British Columbia, our kids, that are out, they've got their education in the United States or in Australia or Ireland or the Caribbean. They want to come back and train in British Columbia. They're begging, please let... In fact, Panit, you introduced me to the young woman that was a pediatrician, as I recall. Born and raised here. Born and raised here in Surrey. Speaks fluent Punjabi. She'd be a fantastic doctor. We need uh, doctors to specialize in, in children in the fastest growing community in the province. She's now practicing, I believe, in Washington State. Is that right? She was actually... It was quicker for her to go to Ontario and start practicing there than in BC. It was a year and a half. She was struggling. Incredible. Yeah, I think she's back now. And, and, and we, we met with her, and here she is wanting to practice in British Columbia, and she can't because of the rules and regulations that have built up over the last 75 years. We're going to change that. We're going to change that, by to use an analogy, by taking a chainsaw and cutting through all of those rules and regulations that get in the way and saying, come on in and help us deal with our housing, our, our, doc, sorry, our doctor crisis that we've got in British Columbia. And we can do that. We just have to choose to do it. And lots of people will be upset. I need to tell you this. There'll be all kinds of people that'll say, oh, I can't believe you're doing this. You know, you're going to make things less safe. No, we're not. 
we're going to make sure that people get get access to a doctor like they deserve. And uh, I think I will end it there and just open it up to questions now, CJ. So thank you all. By the way, best of the season to everybody here. I mean that sincerely. I appreciate you making the time to come over here, uh, particularly uh, you know when the government uh, announced in the last two days that they're going to have a special event to try and draw you away. I appreciate you all taking the time to come out here in spite of that. So thank you. So uh, I think it's very important. This is where a track record, I think, is really important. So I, when I first ran for office and got elected in 2001, we had in British Columbia 128 training spaces at UBC. It was only at UBC that you could be a, trained to be a doctor. And, uh, and that didn't change the previous 10 years that the NDP was back in power in the, in the 1990s. The first thing we did was more than double the training spaces from 128 to 288. Then we said, we need to have not doctors trained just at UBC in Vancouver. We need to expand doctors training to University of Northern BC, the University of BC Okanagan, UVic, so that we started to spread the training of doctors around the province because we knew that if we could train kids in the north to be doctors, they generally stay up the north, right? Because they're, they're kids from all across the north and the northwest. And when they do their studies there, they practice there. That was a good thing. But, you know, we, we have to do more. The, the, this government promised that they would open up another uh, uh, training program for doctors at SFU. Well, the problem is they haven't done anything about it. You know, so it's not good enough to just say we're going to do something and then nothing happens. Now we come up to an election and I'm sure they'll keep making more announcements. Oh, don't worry, it's coming soon. But, you know, at the end of the day, this is my whole point about results. What I have said is exactly what you said. You're right about the Marshall Plan. The Marshall Plan was uh, just an all-of-government effort to say, we've got to save Europe and we're going to do everything it takes to invest and rebuild the you know, war-torn Europe. We, th we have to do the same thing with our housing crisis and with our medical uh, crisis that we have in British Columbia. And that means, that's why I said, we're not going to, just because we've done something for the same way for 75 years, I'm not doing that anymore. We're going to change that very differently because I'm not going to have kids that are from British Columbia, especially, that are highly trained, that want to practice here, and we don't let them in because of ancient rules and regulations that, that have built up over the last 75 years. Not going to do it. So that will require a lot of change. But the other thing I think you have to understand is, and, and this is where, um, you know, if, we're, if we say we're going to build something, then let's get it built. Just don't, you know, when I, when I was in government, we built the $250 million Jimmy Pattison Outpatient Center. We built the $500 million Surrey Memorial Hospital Tower, including the largest Guru Nanak emergency department in the country, because uh, we said we were going to do it. Now, I wish we'd done even more. You know, looking back, I, I wish we'd done even more. Uh, but remember, we designed that, that tower on the third floor. If my memory serves me correct, I'm pretty sure it does. We designed it so you can knock out the wall and build a sky bridge to another tower right next to it, right next to the Dairy Queen, and build a second tower. That's what we need to get going on immediately. I've already announced that we would do that immediately, right? That's something we can do now because it was part of the original plans to allow us to move quickly to build that second tower. That's, we've already got the workers uh, right at Surrey Memorial. They're desperately trying to find space to work in. That's something we can do right away. But what we cannot do is keep saying to people, we're going to build a second hospital, and then only to find out that it's not a hospital that's even going to have a maternity ward. How is that possible that in the fastest growing community with the most children, we're not going to have a maternity ward at the new hospital? You know, I had one of my daughters was born at Surrey Memorial Hospital. The other was born at Peace Arch Hospital. So I've experienced both. And I can tell you in this community, we need more maternity wards. We don't need less. So I, and, and we don't need to be promising something for seven years and not delivering anything. That's not fair to the community. I don't know why it's taken seven years. I, I built lots of infrastructure. It doesn't take seven years to start construction, uh, especially on land that the government owns. Now, you know, so look, you know I've criticized their decision on where they're building it. And, and mainly because it's, it's, it's just on a roadway that doesn't have access to good transit. And we all know it now, how busy number 10 highway is. Can you imagine an ambulance trying to get through to try and get someone to this hospital um, in, in the midst of rush hour? It'd be very challenging. And, but, you know, if, I've always said if, they've start, if they start construction, then we'll honor that for sure. I just, you know, my... The way I think is I said the best, best location would be right on Fraser Highway and 176th Street just because that's where SkyTrain's being built. 
And wouldn't that make it easy for, pa for patients and for, for staff to get you know, back and forth to the hospital, from Surrey Memorial to the new hospital to the Langley Hospital? It just makes a lot more sense. But if they are going ahead with that, we'll support it and we'll make sure it gets built and we might change the services that it's doing to make sure that we you know, look after kids that are being born, et cetera. But uh, um, I just think that we have to get around to, to your point of saying, let's do this like a Marshall Plan and let's get things done and then be held accountable for results. It, it's just, it's one thing to make a promise and not to be able to fulfill it, which is bad. But I think what is even worse is when you make a promise knowing that this is not a correct, this is not something that is even achievable. It's misleading. It's lying, it's misleading, you know, innocent people, voters, and giving them hopes when you know it's not gonna solve anything. So just to Kevin's point, track record speaks a lot. I think the job of the government is not just to make promise and make it happen. It is also, just like all of us who run our businesses or even the ones who work uh, in a business, is to plan, keeping in mind there was, there's going to be an increase in the population, keeping in mind the city is going to grow. How do you make sure that you plan things such that it's easier to add onto the infrastructure in future? Like the example of that is, as you said, planning a tower so that it's easier to build a second tower there, double that requirement with not having to go through a whole lot of a process all over again. So it's not just getting things done, it's also planning and, and getting things done, keeping in mind the need in the future. And that is why I, I think we are where we are if you just talk about the medical sector as well. The things are degrading because the last seven years, nobody thought of there would be an increase in population, there would be an increase in demand. What should we do proactively to fix that problem? I think that's where the difference is. Uh, I don't think our government is somebody or, or a group of people who don't want to do work. I think they want to do work, but I think that acumen is not there to be able to plan and get things done. That's Actually, that's a very good point because I'll, I'll just use a, a related example to make this point that you just made. Like think about 168 beds for Surrey, the fastest growing community in the country. It doesn't make any sense. Like we're under, it, it, the day it opens, it'll be overwhelmed with, with patients, right? With an aging population and all the rest of it. So that, that really concerns me. And the, the other example I'll give is, you know, you look at the Patalo Bridge. You know, when you think about the original Patalo Bridge built in 1938, now just think about the leaders back then said to themselves, you know, we only have 14,000 people living in Surrey, but one day it'll probably be a really big community. So let's build a really huge four lane bridge. I, you know, I'm thinking of the cars back in 1938, you know, those old Fords that, you know, you crank up the engine and b b b going over the bridge. Um, but they still had the vision to say, let's make a really way bigger than they needed in terms of population. But what does this government do? You know, over 80 years later, they replace the four lane bridge with a four lane bridge. And the population of Surrey is over 600,000 people. That makes no sense either. But it's the same thinking in healthcare that's getting us into trouble. They're not thinking, you know, part of your responsibility in government is you have to think beyond the next election. You have to think the next generation. The reason I came back into politics as you all know, was for the same reason, I came back for my kids' generation. I've got a grade five and a grade eight, grade eight daughters. I, I'm coming back for them. And you know, when I was in government, I remember when we said we were going to build LNG, it was strongly opposed by the NDP. When we said we were gonna build the Site C Dam, strongly opposed by the NDP. When we said we supported the twinning of the, the only pipeline that brings oil to the lower mainland from Alberta, Trans Mountain Pipeline, they strongly opposed that too. Those are the three biggest projects we have in British Columbia, by the way. Imagine if all three of those projects weren't, weren't going ahead right now. The Massey Tunnel. The Massey, well, don't even get me going on that one. because. <laughs> but, but my point is this, my point is this, you know, so when they come forward now and say, oh, um, we're gonna have a shortage of power, Site C is not even gonna be enough, and so now we're gonna have to do a special call and ask the private sector to come in and help us through independent power projects. Well, here's the problem. They opposed the Site C project, so thank goodness we got that far enough along that it's, that it's being built, but they also canceled all our in, independent power projects that we did. They canceled them. They said, we, we don't need them. I, it's Gordon Campbell's giveaway to the private sector. You know, he should have never done it. Even though those were wind power, solar power, run of the river power, 90% of them with indigenous populations, they, they canceled all of them or wouldn't renew them. And now they're out years later having to admit 
then not only is site C not enough, but we have to do independent power projects. Like it's, that's the problem, right? It's not thinking ahead. That's what drives me. Well, this, you know, this is why we've been very critical of the government. Because look, at the end of the day, um, the government's made their decision, but they are not helping move this process along. You know, sometimes in government, I used to sit down with mayors that were very opposed to me, right? They didn't, a lot of mayors really hated me when I said I was building the Canada line. <laughs> you know, they really did. And I would sit down with them and I'd say, look, I understand. We're going to have to agree to disagree, but we need to get this done. And we are going to move forward and get it done. So let's work together and figure out how we're going to do that. And we would generally come to some agreement. They would still not like me. And they'd say bad things about me publicly. That's okay. But the point is we would, we would get, move the ball down the court and get it done and get it built. What's happening here is no, you know, if they would just go sit down with the, the mayor and the staff and just close the doors and say, okay, all the media is gone. We're not holding a press conference. We're not going to, you know, make a big political story out of it. Just quietly sit down and say, we've got to make this work. Because at the end of the day, we have a joint responsibility to the residents of this community to ensure that we're going to have a safe community. And they should, but they're not doing that. They're fighting in the media still. You know, they throw a grenade this way, another one comes back this way. And, and the problem is, it's, it's, it's affecting the community. Now, as an opposition, and this is important for you to know, you know, because people get mad at me, oh, you guys, you know, why are you criticizing what they're doing? That means you're against everything. No, no. Our job as official opposition is to oppose government and critique when they're making mistakes or that we think are going to be bad. Sometimes we support government. You know, one of their uh, housing bills we supported because it's something I've been talking about for 18 months, which is more density around transit corridors and transit stations. So that was something we said, yes, that's something we can support. That's a good thing for communities and, and we support you government on that. But you know, when, when they say to Surrey, we're gonna, we're gonna, we've now are gonna take control and tell you that this is the police force you're gonna have. And then they say, and we're not gonna provide enough money to cover the costs. Well, that's a problem. And our job as an opposition is to say, wait a minute, if, if, if this is what you want pro provincial, you know, as a province, and you're not going to provide enough money, we're going to be critical about that because the Surrey residents are going to have to pay that. And it could be a lot of money. And, and Surrey residents might have something to say about that if they see their property taxes going up double digits at a time when we're already the most expensive, but most unaffordable province in the entire country. So, you know... Um, I think that the government has to sit down without media, they don't have to announce it, sit down and they need to talk to the mayor and council and just be adults and make sure this transition is going to be done in a manner that will ensure that we have a safe community in Surrey. Because as you know, this is the fastest growing community. Crime is a big issue in every part of the province. We've already got enough challenges right now under the policies that this government has overseen as far as crime goes and so you know they're gonna they're making it worse if they're gonna continue to take this approach by the way sorry I should have said Bill Jinder is this your are you final year as the president of yes. this yes. congratulations for being a great president of the press club for the last year I do want to recognize yes, that will be an outgoing president outgoing of the press club. yes but still 31st she's going to be the vice president oh you is that what you've done Incoming vice president. oh so you couldn't get away completely they don't let you retire completely that's great we need a woman to give the men in charge. yes thank you good no i don't and i'll tell you why and i'll tell you why i'm not as concerned as a lot of this chatter that you hear um you know when my uh friend ken sim was running for mayor of vancouver he started a brand new party called the ABC party. And 12 months before the election, nobody knew who ABC was, right? It's, and, and it's very normal if you think about it because you know most of the public is not spending their time thinking about provincial politics. They're struggling to meet their family budgets, get their kids to school and raise their families and all the rest of the things, stress at work. Um, so they don't think about provincial politics probably until about a month before an election, if we're really honest about it. That's when people really start paying attention. Um, so. That the reason we changed our name is because we want to make sure that we are the coalition party, the party that people can feel very comfortable supporting, regardless of whether they vote liberal federally or conservative or Green Party. Provincially, they can feel very comfortable under the BC United Party, uh, which follows in a long tradition in BC where, you know, Social Credit Party used to be the party in for 30 years in British Columbia. So... Um, by the time the next election rolls around, I guarantee you this, people will know exactly 
who BC United is. I promise you that. And they will also know who Kevin Falcon is and what he stands for and why I'm going to be fighting very, very hard to remind the public of what we talked about today, how important it is to make sure that we get a government that can get this pro province back on track and we can fix the problems that we face, whether in healthcare, education or crime and affordability especially. Because at the end of the day, I think that's what matters to people. You know, I've been around long enough and, and when I mentioned ABC, remember, you know, by the time the election rolled around, ABC won every single seat they ran a candidate on. And the biggest surprised people were actually the NDP because David Eby was out campaigning for Kennedy Stewart. They thought that Kennedy Stewart was going to win. The polls were suggesting that Kennedy Stewart was going to win. Only when the voters came out did they realize, uh-oh. And that's why polls are a problem now, I tell you honestly. The polls are, are almost useless now because... People don't, you know, the pollsters tell me all the time, people don't answer their phones. They can't get, so what they do is they use online panels. And online panels are notoriously um, inaccurate. So I don't spend a lot of time worried about polls. I was on CBC radio last week, and they asked me about the polls, and I said to them, I said, simple test. I said, don't take my word for it. I guarantee you that most of the BC Conservative support that apparently is enjoying all this support, I said, I guarantee you it's federal conservatives that the public's thinking about when they get asked. And I said, and if you don't believe me, go out and talk to the first 10 random strangers you see out there and ask who the leader of the BC Conservative Party is. And that will give you your answer. So they did. They actually went out and they talked to random people in the streets. Not a single person could name who the leader of the BC Conservative Party is. One person thought it was Pierre Polyev, right? Uh, and the rest of them had no idea. So that's my whole point. By the time the next election rolls around, They'll know who Kevin Falcon is, and they'll definitely know who BC United is, and they'll also see that we've got exceptional candidates with really good policies that are, that are going to fix the challenges we face in British Columbia. That much I guarantee you. Um, I think a lot of us think that this is something new, that just Kevin came in and, and, and just came and thought of changing the name. The change of name and decisions like this are made by the membership, the members of the party. Yes. And this issue has been going on actually for a while. Um, I, correct me if I'm wrong, I think even at Gordon Campbell's time, the membership oh, yeah. changed the name. I know definitely for a fact that during Premier Christy Clark's time, this kept on coming over and over again. And when this, you know, I can say that because I was also Kevin's leadership co-chair with, mm -hmm. with Honorable Diane Watts. And so when our leadership race started, this issue came up again because the leadership race is all membership of the party. And so the members were asking this question again. And, and the kind of leader that Kevin is, he decided, OK, you know what? Everyone has been putting this issue aside. I'm going to just deal with it once and for all and go. Um, and so, members can vote. Yeah. yeah. And, and the decision would be up to the membership. So in our convention, you know, the membership um, with a huge majority said that, Kevin, we want to change the name of the party. And so as a leader of the party, your job is to go with what the membership wants. And the perception out there is that oh, we've changed our name because all of a sudden we don't want to be associated with Christy Clark or we don't want her to know. This has been an issue that's been going on for more than you know, a decade and a half. The difference is that he came and he dealt with it and he said, okay, this is not what I'm going to let the membership to distract us. We'll just get the name change out of the way and go on and just focus on what we need to do. I think this is why this was, you know. Okay, very good. Over 90% supportive. But just one Sorry. thing I'll say too is um, I also think the idea of United is really important to me because there is a lot of division in the world right now and even in the province. And I think it's important that we work to unite people together. Um, and, and we can... Uh, we can disagree with each other, but we can disagree agreeably, if you know what I mean. And that's always the approach I had when I was a minister. I had lots of people that disagreed with the policy decisions we were making. But, you know, I would sit down with them and talk and listen. I always listen, and I will change. I am one person that will change direction. If people can, especially if they bring me facts that show that, you know, the direction we're going in isn't working or, or you know, maybe we've made a mistake. You have to, you just have to be open to that. The, the biggest concern I have with the, the current government is they don't seem to show that ability to change direction, even when the evidence is so clear that things aren't working. That's a real, that's a real worry. You know, in the business community, if you did that, you wouldn't be in business very long. And so the problem is the, the people in the government right now have, don't come from a business background. So they don't seem to understand that if you're getting really bad worsening results, you, you better do things differently or you'll keep getting worse. So I'll give you overdose crisis. You know, the overdose death rates are going up every single year to the highest levels we've ever seen. It's really tragic. But government says their answer is let's just keep doing more of the same. 
and, and we'll keep getting the same bad results if we do that. So I think it's an excellent question. And, and you know, the part you missed was where I talked about the importance of holding government, including ourselves, accountable for results. And this is where I do think the track record is important, right? Um, and the thing that frustrates me is that the, the current government has been announcing a second hospital for seven years now, as you know. And part of what I talked about before you got here was their last announcement. Uh, the only thing that was different about it was they dragged a piece of heavy equipment behind them, put on hats, and pretended they were starting something. They weren't. The announcement was actually that it was delayed two more years and that the cost had gone up by $1.22 billion. So here's the, here's the thing. We were in government too. We built the $500 million Surrey Memorial Tower in the largest emergency department in the country. We built the $250 million Jimmy Pattison Outpatient Center. But when we built the $500 million Surrey Tower, we also designed it so that on the third floor you can knock out the wall, it's designed that way, and build a, a little sky bridge and build a second tower right beside it, right next to the Dairy Queen so that you can immediately get a new tower built and up. And I've said publicly, when I was out uh, meeting with the doctors and the nurses um, out at uh, Surrey Memorial Hospital, oh, I think it was in the summer, it was in the summer, and I'd set up a meeting, and I'm not kidding, once the NDP found out I was meeting with them, Adrian Dix came in the day before to meet with them quickly, to say, oh, don't worry, we're going to do all these things. And, you know, the doctor said to me, you know, the problem is they keep making these promises, but we're not seeing any difference here. That, that is the problem. When I say I'm going to do something, I do it. When I said I was going to build the South Fraser Perimeter Road, it got built. When I said I was going to build the Portman Bridge, it got built. When I said that we were going to you know, build the hospital, it got built. So the point is, I think it's important we hold them accountable for the actual results. Right now, you know, and I said earlier, you weren't here, but one of my daughters was born at Surrey Memorial Hospital. The other was born at Peace Arch. So I have experience at both hospitals. And I go in and meet with the doctors regularly. I have never seen a situation ever where I've seen doctors having to take their own personal time on a weekend to go out and hold a rally to try and raise attention to how bad things are at the hospital. And the, what I keep hearing from the doctors is nothing is changing. You know, the government, the, Adrian Dix will roll in and say, oh, don't worry, we'll do all, he makes all these promises and then he leaves and nothing happens, right? And what are they doing? We're now seeing they're renting a motel room to send patients to a motel. Okay, this is awful. They're now putting a portable for kids, you know, to have to be treated at the hospital. You know, and, and they're going to build a second hospital they've been announcing for seven years with only 168 beds, okay? In, a, in the fastest growing community in the country. I don't understand even how they think about these problems. I really don't, because I'll tell you, Surrey is being shortchanged. I'm an MLA now from Vancouver. I used to be an MLA in Surrey. Vancouver's got hospitals everywhere. UBC Hospital, VGH, St. Paul's, St. Joseph's, you got hospitals everywhere. Surrey's got two. One, really, Surrey Memorial, and then Peace Arch and South Surrey White Rock. Do you remember? The Adrian Dix tried to shut down the maternity ward at the, at the South Surrey Peace Arch Hospital. And he, they were going to move it all to Langley. What? And it was only when the MLA, Trevor Halford at the time, said, are you kidding over my dead body? And, I, and they heard I was coming out too because I was the one that was a minister that provided dollars for the maternity ward there. So it's a beautiful maternity ward. Why would they even think about shutting it down? So I don't, you are right. So just hear this from me and know this. When I become the premier of this province, I'm not going to be spending a lot of time making announcements and re-announcements. We're going to get going. We're going to knock out that wall on the third floor. We'll get going on that tower. Okay? A lot of the design work's already done. We can just get going on building it. And that's important because we need to make sure that we get patient beds at that critical hospital. I'm going to probably build it a lot higher than was originally proposed just because our population's growing so much. And then if the NDP gets started on that second hospital, we'll finish it. We may change what's doing in there because I want to make sure, you know, I've always said it's a terrible location and I haven't changed my opinion on that, but if, if they get started on it, we'll make sure it gets finished properly for the benefit of the community. Um, but it, I can't believe they're building a second hospital without a maternity ward in the fastest growing community in the country. It just makes no sense to me. But we'll make sure that that gets done too. But Surrey probably needs a third hospital to be the, have the planning started today. Because, you know, that's why when I was in government, we made a lot of decisions that we know were going to happen after. When we said we were going to build Site C, which I talked about earlier, that was in 2010. 
when I was with Gordon Campbell and Fort St. John and we said we were building that. We're now in 2023, okay? And it's just finishing up and it'll still take probably another nine months. But, you know, that's how long these things take. But we would do it because we were thinking about the next generation, not the next election. And the problem is with this government is they're always just thinking about the elections. So that's why they spend all their time doing announcements. They're good at announcements. They make them all the time. They're just not good at results. I promise you I want to be held accountable for results. Sure, I've moved it to the beginning of the year only because um, when the NDP brought in, remember, it was only, uh, I think, a month before the end of the legislative session when they brought in all their housing bills. And uh, that was really problematic for all the opposition to have to, you know, so, so the bottom line is this. Because we had to spend a lot of time figuring out what the heck they were doing with their housing bills, we deferred making our announcement because of the fact that we were dealing with all the housing legislation they brought forward. And much of that legislation is very problematic, as you know. The short-term rentals that they brought in, we actually support the idea of uh, limiting the number of Airbnbs so we get more long-term rentals in the communities. But, but what they brought in was so poorly drafted. We brought forward very common sense amendments so that, for example, we would deal with the situation like if there's a wedding in Surrey and you've got people coming from around the country or even around the province to come down to Surrey for the wedding without Airbnbs, where are they all going to stay? You know, hotel room rates are going to go through the roof. And that's the same for the film industry. When the film industry comes here and they, you know, are going to bring in all their actors and workers and everything else that are going to spend several months here, they use Airbnb. Now that option's gone. What's going to happen when, when Taylor Swift comes here next year? And we've got, you know, a uh, hundred and, what is it? Uh, I don't know, over 200,000 people that will be coming from around the province and around the world to attend those concerts. Well, you know what's going to happen? They're going to be trying to find hotel rooms. Already there was a story in the newspaper about how a couple from Florida, right? You're nodding your head. Yeah, a couple from Florida uh, tried to rent two nights at a Days Inn hotel in Vancouver. Over $3,000, right? That's what's going to happen. And we tried to warn them by bringing in amendments to make the legislation better. They rejected all the amendments. And so too with their, their housing plan that says, we're going to make every single family home now a potential to build up to four homes. Well, we're all from Surrey. Everyone here remembers what happened in Clayton when they brought in the carriage homes. Do you remember all the parking problems and fist fights and neighbors fighting with each other? It caused a huge problem. The NDP hasn't even thought this through. They don't understand that when you take a single family street of 10 homes, let's say, and you want to make it 40, you have to up upgrade all the sewer, the water, the power. It's very expensive. Who's going to pay for all that? You know, if it's going to be the, the buyers, well, those aren't going to be affordable homes. They're going to be very expensive homes. So this is the problem, I think, is that they, um, they just haven't thought through what they're doing because none of them have any experience. I don't pretend to be the best expert in housing, but I did spend 10 years in, in working for a company that built more housing than the NDP government did in the entire time they've been in power. We built more housing in the same period of time that the NDP have been in power than they did. And um, I'm just very, very concerned about, uh, about the, you know, what they brought forward and the lack of results it's going to get for the residents of Surrey and around the province. Puneet, today is Kevin Falcon, who is BC United's leader. You are the candidate of Surrey Serpentine River. Today, the press conference is very open. What do you think about that? Well, I think the purpose of the press conference is to talk about the news. You can share your ideas, share your opinions, share your opinions, share your opinions, share your opinions. So I think it was very successful. It's great. Kevin is never shy away. I'm always going to ask you a question so that I can answer your questions. I'm not going to ask you a question, I'm not going to ask you a question, I'm not going to ask you a question, I'm not going to ask you a question. It's just another day that we've seen him shine. So, you start the riding, I think, a little bit later. Because the election will be at any time in the next year. So, tentatively, it should be in October. But, I think the polls are high riding. So, maybe the election will be soon. So, the party and the riding, you are ready? Well, you know, any candidate who has announced their name is always ready. And obviously, it makes a difference with the snap elections. But, 
ਅਸੀਂ ਸਾਰੇ ਤਿਆਰ ਹਾਂ ਜੀ ਐਨੀ ਟਾਈਮ ਰੈਡੀ ਹੈਗੇ ਆ ਬਟ ਹੈਵਿੰਗ ਸੈਡ ਥੈਟ ਆਈ ਥਿੰਕ ਥਿਸ ਸ਼ੁਡ ਨਾਟ ਬੀ ਟੇਕਨ ਲਾਈਟਲੀ ਜੇ ਇਲੈਕਸ਼ਨਸ ਅਰਲੀ ਕਾਲ ਹੁੰਦੀਆਂ ਬਿਕਾਜ਼ ਇਹ ਤੇ ਓਪਰਚੁਨਿਜ਼ਮ ਹੋ ਗਿਆ ਵੀ ਮੇਰੇ ਪੋਲਸ ਇਸ ਵੇਲੇ ਠੀਕ ਹੈ ਤਾਂ ਮੈਂ ਇਲੈਕਸ਼ਨਸ ਅਰਲੀ ਕਰ ਲਵਾਂ ਆਫਟਰ ਸੇਇੰਗ ਆਈ ਥਿੰਕ ਅ ਮਿਲੀਅਨ ਟਾਈਮਸ ਔਨ ਡਿਫਰੈਂਟ ਮੀਡੀਆ ਆਊਟਲੈਟਸ ਕਿ ਇਲੈਕਸ਼ਨਸ ਜਿਹੜੀਆਂ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਟਾਈਮ ਤੇ ਹੋਣੀਆਂ ਚਾਹੀਦੀਆਂ ਉਹਦੇ ਹੋਣਗੀਆਂ ਐਂਡ ਆਈ 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 I hope EB David EB will keep his word and I think he will. Um I don't think early elections hon gaya aur na hi honiyan chahiye ne par je hon gaya te assi taiyar ha. So and ch tusi sade jehde viewers ha ki khana chao. Well main hamesha hi kehni hai ji sare nu I'm not just saying this because I'm a candidate ke you know jehde political decisions jehdi sarkaran lendiyan ne whether oh federal government hove provincial government hove municipal government hove ohna de decisions sadi zindagi nu affect karde ne. ਭਾਵੇਂ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਘਰ ਦੇ ਮੇਲ ਹੋਮੋ ਫੀਮੇਲ ਹੋਮੋ ਸਿੰਗਲ ਯੂ نو ਯੰਗ ਯੂਥ ਹੋਮੋ ਕੋਈ ਵੀ ਹੋਵੇ ਤੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਡਿਸੀਜਨਸ ਉਹ ਲੈਂਦੇ ਨੇ ਸਰਕਾਰ ਜਦੋਂ ਡਿਸੀਜਨਸ ਲੈਂਦੀ ਹੈ ਸਾਡੀ ਜ਼ਿੰਦਗੀ ਨੂੰ ਇੰਪੈਕਟ ਕਰਦੀ ਹੈ ਇਸ ਕਰਕੇ ਬਹੁਤ ਜ਼ਰੂਰੀ ਹੈ ਅਵੇਅਰ ਹੋਣਾ ਕਿ ਸਾਡੀਆਂ ਸਰਕਾਰਾਂ ਵਾਲੇ ਦੁਆਲੇ ਕੀ ਕਰ ਰਹੀਆਂ ਨੇ ਬਹੁਤ ਜ਼ਰੂਰੀ ਹੈ ਆਪਣੇ ਕੰਨ ਯੂ نو ਖੁੱਲੇ ਰੱਖਣੇ ਔਰ ਅਬਜ਼ਰਵ ਕਰਨਾ ਔਰ ਇਨਵੋਲਵ ਹੋਣਾ ਜਾ ਕੇ ਵੋਟਾਂ ਪਾਉਣੀ ਹਾਂ ਇਨਵੋਲਵ ਹੋਣ ਪਹਿਲਾਂ ਪਹਿਲਾਂ ਸੁਣਨਾ ਅਵੇਅਰ ਹੋਣਾ ਬੀ ਇਨਫੋਰਮਡ ਐਂਡ ਦੈਨ ਗੋ ਐਂਡ ਪਾਰਟਿਸਿਪੇਟ ਤੇ ਸਾਡੇ ਬਜ਼ੁਰਗਾਂ ਨੇ ਤਾਂ ਬਹੁਤ ਲੜਾਈਆਂ ਕੀਤੀਆਂ ਨੇ ਰਾਈਟ ਟੂ ਵੋਟ ਲੈਣ ਵਾਸਤੇ ਸਾਡੇ ਯੂ نو ਸਾਡੀ ਕਮਿਊਨਿਟੀ ਵਾਸਤੇ ਸਾਡੇ ਕੋਲ ਤਾਂ ਰਾਈਟ ਟੂ ਵੋਟ ਵੀ ਨਹੀਂ ਸੀਗੀ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਇਹ ਯੂ نو ਦਿੱਤੀ ਹੈ ਰਾਈਟ ਔਰ ਇਹ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਵੋਟ ਪਾਉਣੀ ਹੈ ਇਹ ਸਾਡੀ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਰਾਈਟ ਦੇ ਨਾਲੋਂ ਜ਼ਿੰਮੇਵਾਰੀ ਹੈ ਇਹ ਸਾਡੀ ਪ੍ਰਿਵਿਲੇਜ ਨਹੀਂ ਹੈਗੀ ਇਹ ਸਾਡੀ ਜ਼ਿੰਮੇਵਾਰੀ ਹੈ ਸੋ ਇਨਫੋਰਮ ਹੋਵੋ ਪਹਿਲਾਂ ਦੇਖੋ ਵਾਲੇ ਦੁਆਲੇ ਕੌਣ ਤੁਹਾਡੇ ਲਈ ਬੈਟਰ ਹੈ ਐਂਡ ਦੈਨ ਫਿਰ ਵੋਟ ਪਾਓ ਬਿਕਾਜ਼ ਮੈਂ ਕੈਂਡੀਡੇਟ ਹੈਗੀ ਔਰ ਮੈਂ ਹੈਵ ਆਲਵੇਸ ਸਪੋਰਟਡ ਯੂ نو ਦੀ ਦੀ ਡਿਸੀਜਨਸ ਜੋ ਜੋ ਐਸ ਪ੍ਰੋਵਿੰਸ ਚ ਸਾਡੀ ਪਾਰਟੀ ਨੇ ਕੀਤਾ ਤਾਂ ਮੈਂ ਤੇ ਆਬਵੀਅਸਲੀ ਕਹਾਂਗੀ ਵੀ ਇਫ ਯੂ ਆਰ ਇਨਫੋਰਮਡ ਯੂ ਵਿਲ ਸੀ ਕਿ ਪ੍ਰੀਵੀਅਸਲੀ ਜਿਹਨੂੰ ਆਪਾਂ ਬੀਸੀ ਲਿਬਰਲ ਪਾਰਟੀ ਕਹਿੰਦੇ ਸੀ ਹੁਣ ਬੀਸੀ ਯੂਨਾਈਟਿਡ ਪਾਰਟੀ ਹੈ ਦੈਟ ਇਜ਼ ਦ ਰਾਈਟ ਚੋਇਸ ਥੈਂਕ ਯੂ ਬਨੀਤ ਐਂਡ ਬੈਸਟ ਵਿਸ਼ੇਸ ਫੋਰ ਦਾ ਹੋਲੀਡੇ ਸੀਜ਼ਨ ਐਂਡ ਅ ਹੈਪੀ ਨਿਊ ਇਅਰ and sare sunan wale anu bhi sare anu have a very very good holiday season i know is saal bahut lokan liye bada challenging reha hai but let's just hope ke you know holidays to si sare time apni family na spend kar sako and on wala saal sare liye khushhal hove thank you very much so kevin we had a very good uh, press conference with south asian media and it was a very good turnout uh, you covered a lot of issues very deeply and and you're very concerned about the communities yes. affordability is the big issue and health care so you know the british columbians are suffering in a number of areas what do you take on that well you know and i hear that all the time because as i travel around uh, the communities including surrey i hear of truck drivers that are leaving to go to alberta uh, because it's more affordable same with taxi drivers same with young people we now see that that's backed up by what the statistics are showing that more people are leaving british columbia for other provinces than are coming into british columbia that we haven't seen that kind of out migration since the last time the ndp were in power in the 1990s and the reason is because it is the most expensive province in canada we've got the highest housing prices in the country the highest fuel prices in the country the highest average rents in the country and that's just not acceptable and so that's why we've said we're going to permanently eliminate provincial fuel taxes that will drop the price at the tank by 15 cents a liter we're going to stop david eby's attempt to triple the carbon tax we're going to fight that every step of the way because we shouldn't be tripling the carbon tax over the next 6 years and we're going to make things more affordable so uh you know normally it goes about the politicians that the big talk and they promise a lot like the ndp yes. did for last 7 years yeah. how you will deliver on your promise yeah. and how you make your cabinet accountable when you become a premier well first of all i think you have to look at the track record so when people say okay if kevin falcon's the premier will he do these things well look what i did while i was in government uh you know when i said i was going to build the portman bridge it got built when i said i was going to build the south fraser primner road it got built when i said we were going to widen 176th street number 10 highway to four lanes we did that and this is the you know when i said we were going to build the 500 million dollar tower at surrey memorial
So what is your final message to my viewers? Well, my final message is a hopeful, optimistic one, because I do think it's important for your viewers to know that, you know, I am very optimistic about British Columbia. We do live in the greatest province, in the greatest country in the world. And we just have to remember, we've got incredibly talented people. We have a diverse population and working together, united, I think we can actually fix a lot of the problems that we're facing right now. We just have to have the kind of leaders that know how to do it, that have a track record of being in government and getting big things done and that's what i uh, commit to all your your uh, listeners so and your your viewers i would also say this i hope everyone has a wonderful holiday season and uh, enjoy time with your families because families are the most important thing and your health thank you kevin it's thank always you a pleasure. thank you my friend